Cool. All right. Well, let, why don't we get going? So, so I'll uh, start off, and then I'll pass it off to my colleagues, and then we wanted to uh, hear from you guys, and then we'll do a little um, icebreaker kind of thing, get to know each other. But um, so my name is Sean Anderson. I'm a professor at um, California State University Channel Islands, um, and I've been doing microplastic stuff for it seems about 145 years, but it's actually only about 14 years or so. Um, and so, uh, super stoked you guys are here, and my colleagues. I'm Wayne, I'm research director at the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research. We're a newer nonprofit. We have about nine researchers. We focus on um, microplastic analysis. We do a lot of contract based work. People send us samples, we process them, and then we also do a lot of research. And, and I'm the one writing a lot of the papers coming out of that group. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Holmas. I'm a professor of research at Stanford University of San Marcos. And uh, I currently do. And we want to meet all you guys. We want to first say that this is a, a, a thing all four of us have worked on. And so we, it, was, it was pitched as like workshop one, workshop two, but we're really treating it as one big giant workshop. And so we'll all be chiming in throughout the, um, the day. Um, so uh, real quickly, just timing wise, so we have about four hours to get through this stuff. We'll see if some things might go super fast, some things might take a little bit longer, but it's, it's all good, we're flexible. And if there's particular things you guys would like to delve in more into depth or ask questions, this is here to be a, of service to you all. And so, so by all means, feel free to raise your hand or, or, or ask us a question, interrupt us, it's, it's great. Um, that's what we want. Uh, we talked about our facilities here, which, which are awesome. I'm assuming our temperature is great. If for some reason it gets super hot or super cold, just tell one of us and we'll have them uh, uh, fix the temperature, but it should be great. And so our format for today is we're going to start off with our policy focus and talking about sort of the, the policy approaches and things of that nature um, to deal with plastics, microplastics, all this, all this crazy world we're in. Um, and then the second half will be focused more on methodology and, and how we do some of the particulars of spectrum characterization and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you don't have to have a computer per se. But for our second half especially, there's going to be some exercise. If you have a computer or, or a, um, a laptop or a um, tablet, um, it'll be real fun. You guys can try running stuff. Um, so so uh, if, you, if you have one but it's in your room, when we take a break, you can run and grab it. Um, that would be helpful. We're also recording this, these presentations so that you guys can watch them later or share them with other folks once we get them up um, if you find them useful. And, uh, and we'll have some other resources and stuff too. The other one, um, just want to point out, uh, we weren't sure how many folks were sort of naive in terms of dealing with microplastics, how many people are super experienced. So just in case, on the back table, whenever we take a break, we have a couple microscopes, uh, or a tr st traditional microscopes and um, a video microscope that we use when we go around to schools and stuff. Um, if you haven't seen microplastics or you haven't seen a fiber or a particle, um, by all means go and, and take a look at one before we uh, take off. Um, so that's uh, just in case. I suspect that almost everybody here probably has at least seen some of these items, but, but um, we wanted to make sure everybody had the opportunity. And then we'll just try to pause incrementally going around. If we need, we need a stretch break, a bathroom break, you guys definitely tell us because I will ramble forever probably. So, so um, um, again, we're trying to be as, as useful to you all and be as interactive as possible. So that's the basic format for today. Is that sound, anything else my colleagues wanted to chime in on? Yeah, okay, all right, great. Okay, so let's start off by, by, by uh, introducing ourselves to everybody. So why doesn't everybody stand up? <laughs> love it, love it, love it. <laughs> awesome, so, uh, so we'll get going here. Um, and as a reminder, um, you, we'll make um, uh, the slides available to you guys. There, there might be one or so slide later on that we're gonna embargo with, that Sarah's gonna show us, but almost all these things are available to you. So if you want to use any of these in, in public presentations or, 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 or that kind of stuff, by all means, um, we're trying to make these things resources to you guys. So um, 
We'll start off talking a little bit about policy in a very sort of theoretical sense, talk a little bit about the history of plastics so that we're all on the same page, also a little bit about the state of our science, and then we'll spend some time talking about some of the current um, perceptions, some of the public attitudes and opinions people have about um, plastics and plastic pollution. Um, and then um, we'll go into uh, talking about some of our specific policies, uh, particularly here in California, and, and how those have manifested, et cetera. And then we have a little bit of an activity for you all. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, current things and then this idea of uh, working to have some accreditation going on for um, as, when we try to look at the efficacy of policies going forward. Do we know if they're working or, or, uh, or not? So that, that's our, this is sort of part one of our workshops today. Um, and so again, interrupt me if I'm not making sense. Um, but we're going to start off talking about uh, general concepts in terms of policy. So most of us are scientists. We don't typically do policy. And so these things are perhaps sometimes a little foreign to us. But um, in short, policy is how we deal with hard challenges, right? If stuff was easy, if everybody was already walking up the hill, we wouldn't need a policy to say, let's walk up the hill, right? But these are tools to help us deal with things that are potentially uncomfortable or whatever. And it's our way, particularly today in our society, it's, it's a way of doing this without vigilantism, without benign neglect, without any of these things that are sort of pulling apart society seems to want to push us towards. Um, really good policy can also help us uh, create standards and expectations for how we behave and, and, um, and beyond the actual um, maybe letter of the law of the policy, but help us sort of provide more uh, sideboards in what we're doing. Um, and uh, typically we enforce these things locally, but in particular, I think the example of, of plastics and microplastics pollution, it really highlights the need to make sure that we have, even though we might be enforcing them locally, that we have some global approaches, some global standards. Um, and um, yeah, and so I'll just say the classic environmental policy, um, which again is what a lot of us think of, um, has used sort of four basic approaches and typically uh, most of us, to, is that okay, is that too tall? I guess that's probably good, you guys can see that okay? Um, uh, is uh, the, the classic, what, what some people call command and control regulation. So these, this is our Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, that kind of stuff, where we're providing specific uh, restraints on a particular entity. So you can only go this fast, you can only make this particular compound, that kind of stuff. And that's what most of us think of, think of when we talk about microplastic or plastic pollution policy. Um, but there are other approaches. Um, there's market-based incentives. These things really grew up in particular in the 80s and 90s. People attempted to use these to, to deal with uh, pollution stuff. Um, and the argument has been, oh, the, these things are going to be more cost effective at getting to the same place as command and uh, control regulations. Um, I would say that is uh, up for debate whether that actually happens, but, but that's the, the so-called promise. And then there's some uh, approaches where people try to blend those two, sort of the incentivized and the, and the sort of the carrot and the stick type of approach. And then the last one, um, mm -hmm. which really hasn't worked particularly well, but those are uh, in the context of plastic uh, management, but that's the voluntary initiatives. However, in the early stages, of um, a, a pollution problem, let's say, before we actually have our arms around it, the voluntary initiatives can give us some important guidance in, in, in um, sort of first try uh, types of approaches. Um, so all four of these are actually in our toolbox. Yeah, please. Is it okay if, I, if we Please, 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 please. Um, I think it would be, it, so it depends on how it's enacted, because you could have precautionary principles written into the law, right? So that, that could be the command and control. I'd say the best would be sort of a, a hybrid, right? Where you, where you both are required to do the precautionary, but also y your culture is such that people would want to take a precautionary approach. So that, that, I think that would be ideally both of the hybrid. But yeah, yeah, cool. And this is how, in the US, this is how our policies have, have basically evolved. Um, so way back when, when we first started what we now might consider environmental policy, it was really about natural resources and public lands, most of the regulations. Sometimes things like Migratory Bird Act was about a particular organism, but for the most part it was about landscapes and things of that nature. Um, after World War II, stuff begins to change and we start to have our first sort of more cohesive approaches to policies that actually try to look beyond just that, um, that landscape or, or that particular issue. 
and that really builds a lot of outrage with with the um, not not completely effectiveness of those approaches and really culminating with things like the Cuyahoga River catching on fire for the fifth time people like the river is not supposed to be on fire or uh, the ocean full of oil uh, off the Santa Barbara coast where all the media people vacationed and so um, were very outraged whereas when that would happen in you know Nigeria or places like that it wasn't wasn't on people's mind but but those events leading to the Earth Day, the uh, first um, formal Earth Day, um, that really takes us into what most of us think of as the golden age of environmental policies. And these are the, the, the groups of laws that um, uh, federal, but also state, but especially federal, that come out in the um, 70s, early 70s to late 70s. So Clean Water Act, NEPA, all these foundational guidance documents that most of us that have come up after that just take for granted and assume that's how things always were. That was not how things always were. It's important to say that when most of those were passed, they were passed almost unanimously. The Endangered Species Act, um, 93, there were 93 yes votes in this, the Senate, um, which is hard to sort of imagine now. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know the EPA was created by President Nixon, right? I mean, so, so things have changed a lot in terms of political support and things of that nature. Um, but that, the golden age of that environmental regulation really ends in the sort of 90s or so. And um, because we get a lot of pushback, which we'll talk about in a second, but um, we really start to move into this other era, which is less focused just on the US and is more trying to take a global perspective with things like carbon emissions and stuff of that nature. Also, the introduction in particular of environmental justice issues where, where rather than the traditional, um, the tree for the tree's sake, which is still important, also trying to incorporate voices that have been marginalized or groups that have not been at the table to talk about paths forward. Um, and that's sort of the era that we um, are in uh, right now. Um, Important for us, even though we're not going to focus on this a whole lot, but it's important for us to understand as, we, as if you are interested in starting to talk more about policies and things of this nature to address plastic pollution and that kind of stuff, that there is a, a very powerful um, counter movement that has been born up really since the 80s, but really gotten a lot of um, energy since uh, about 9-11 or so and, and has, has gotten quite powerful in general. Um, these are very organized movements against, let's say, regulating or reducing plastic emission. Um, and uh, there's a lot of what people uh, have termed uh, greenwashing or astroturfing or these types of approaches that uh, might sound really reasonable or really good or really authentic on the surface, but really are um, uh, you know, PR, propaganda, persuasion machines as opposed to sort of a, a more open debate about should we or shouldn't we. Um, most of these movements um, really have distinct ideological and political underpinnings. Um, in particular, some certain uh, socioeconomic groups tend to really um, uh, uh, be um, uh, interested in these types of things. But in general, it's a lot of la laissez-faire e economics, a lot of libertarian approaches. We shouldn't be, you shouldn't be telling me what to do type of, type of arguments. Um, the, the tactics are very effective and have been incredibly um, uh, useful to delay action. Almost all of these were born in the tobacco industry in the 60s and were um, uh, further uh, intensified um, by oil and gas starting in the 70s and 80s. But, but these tools are now very ubiquitous across a lot of um, uh, uh, debates around pollution and different environmental regulation. And, um, and so if you are beginning to get into the policy world, you should just, um, not that you should run away or anything, but you should just be aware that, the, that you can maybe engender a lot of um, pushback that are, is incredibly sophisticated um, that could be um, lobbied against you. And that we as scientists are not used to that, right? We're used to publishing stuff, talking about this, this is what I found, and, um, and that's not always what we get. And the last thing to say is this counter movement is very adaptable and very persistent and, and increasingly very well funded. Um, and so one quick example before we turn to more um, uh, important stuff um, is a great example of this is the stuff that if we pick up any of our plastic items and look at the bottom of those triangles, right? So those triangles are really born of a previous era where, where we were attempting to deal with this plastic waste, particularly single-use waste. Um, and uh, essentially in the late 80s, um, when, when the plastics manufacturer folks uh, understood what was coming down, they introduced this, uh, um, this uh, triangular labeling for our items um, 
that really were to imply this is, this is how we can better recycle. This is how we can better not waste. This is how we can better be more efficient, close the loop, all that kind of stuff. And quite frankly, it was all BS, right? So it was very deceptive. Um, it implies, just because something has this little a triangle, it implies that it actually is recyclable, that we have the capability on a, on a practical sense to, to, to take that material, turn it back into uh, a, a stream that we could use it for something else. Um, and it really was, was incredibly effective in making you all worry about this, right? Shift the blame from the, the, the system, the industry, to you. And oh my God, which bin do I put this in? And oh, I think I better, I'm not sure if this goes in the plasma bin, so I'm just gonna put it in anyway, which people have called wish cycling, right? Which doesn't do anything, just clogs up the stream and, and all that kind of jazz. Um, and and is has been very effective that it has the air of Earth Day. It has the air of doing something when in effect it's allowing business as usual to just keep ch chugging along. And just for clarity, most of us probably know this, but only ones and fives are really um, uh, recyclable. And even those, it's, it's only a, a, small, um, a small piece of that. Um, so that, that was maybe a little negative stuff to start with, um, but I don't want to be negative. So I'll just say that um, there's lots of stuff that's going on in the policy world. And as we go on today, we'll talk about some more specific stuff. But I do want to say that um, there's been a lot of, of attention paid to this by our, our colleagues in various parts of our society. And one of the neatest things is we don't have to solve everything. So we'll hear from um, Sam in a little bit about some of the different examples of policies that, were, that, that, are, that are out there now and laws and stuff. But um, uh, it's okay if this law doesn't work right. And so there's sort of a virtuous cycle that's sort of spun up in the last couple of years where, for example, the state of California would try a new policy, a new law to regulate plastics, and there'd be some problem with it. And then the next year, New Jersey will go and make theirs and learn from what, what we didn't do right, and they'll make a version of it. And then New York will learn what New Jersey, so there's a sort of constant sort of learning from each other, um, and, and that has been really helpful in, in is making our policies more effective as we go forward. Okay, so brief history of plastics. Um, this is uh, a timeline, so this is about the last 200 odd years from the left to the right. And what we see here is, the uh, mid to late 1800s to early 1900s, lots of innovation, lots of innovation. Oh my gosh, like, oh, look, we just invented this thing. What the hell is this? I don't know, but maybe we can use it for something, right? So stuff that wasn't necessarily invented for, some was invented for particular use, but more just sort of this age of discovery and oh my God, this is pretty cool. And so that really leads to this big flush. We get most of our categories of plastics, um, uh, broad categories essentially crafted by essentially in, in, in the decade after World War II, uh, up to that point. Um, the stuff that you and I more typically deal with, which would be monitoring and understanding that there might be a problem associated with these materials that are being generated, gets going, uh, you know, a sort of a, a generation after that. So starting in the 30s, um, we start to um, have some of the first evidence of, of microplastics getting into sediments, um, uh, and, and all this and that, and then we get to the sort of 60s and 70s, and it starts coming out uh, more and more rapidly. Um, to the point now where, and this is, this is a very selective list, right? But, but the point is, um, more and more stuff as uh, increasing incredibly uh, exponentially uh, as we go forward. And so, so the, fir the first thing there, the orange thing is sort of the innovation. The, the pink thing is, is the sort of you and I kind of assessment science-y kind of folks, toxicology type folks. And the blue is uh, societal points. And so what you'll see is, um, while, while, whereas there's a big cluster on the innovation early on, and then uh, a big cluster later on for us monitoring this, culturally these plastics have been embedded throughout our culture the whole time. And so um, we, we have the term plastic surgery coined, but then really it gets going when um, uh, there's this competition to see if we can make artificial uh, pool, pool cues um, and, and the race to use something other than ivory. Um, and then from there, um, uh, very quickly start to uh, use plastic for other things that are durable. So those, those billiard balls are durable, right? You, you're gonna smack that ball several times. Then for personal items that sort of last a long time, and then it's not really until we get to the, to the sort of World War II era, really, that we start to get into, in the wake of that, that we start to get into more of this disposable culture. 
And, and plastics now are ubiquitous across our societies, as, as we all could tell from when we asked the first thing we touched this morning. Um, so a couple quotes here that I think is just important for you guys to make sure you understand. Initially, this stuff is all seen as endless possibility, right? This is this was not crafted to screw people over. This was crafted to solve problems. And so um, before the um, uh, before before World War II, we were producing about a hundred uh, metric uh, kilograms, uh, a, a million kilograms a year. After World War II, there's this massive uh, explosion in plastic production, and then after the war, that's turned to the to the, the civilian world. And here's a quote from the guy that invented Tupperware, the ubiquitous thing that was across all of suburbia, suburbia et cetera. So with the end of the war, polyethylene was another young veteran that had um, accelerated from childhood to a fighting job. It had done its job well, but like all young vets returning from war, it had never had civilian adult experience. And so that's literally how these guys were thinking of this. This is this sort of war mentality and oh my God, we're gonna march our, our resources forward. Um, uh, another. Uh, quote here uh, talking about the, the, I think captured the real uh, cultural perspective of plastics in the wake of World War II, which is it's a world free from moth and rust and full of color, a world largely built up of synthetic materials made from the most universally distributed substances, a world in which nations are more and more independent of localized natural resources, a world in which man, because we're not talking about dudes back then, right, man, like a magician, makes what he wants for almost every need out of what is beneath and around him. So this is really an aspirational thing, right? This is like the freeing us from constraints. Everybody can benefit from this stuff. And so these are the kind of ads you see. So you see these sort of, you know, colonize this new, new virgin land with these incredible products that are, that are wonderful and all this and that. On the right is the, the first commercial uh, oven to make Bakelite, which is our first sort of really widely distributed uh, plastic that we don't make anymore, but, but up until, um, uh, the wake of World War I, it was, it was really, really popular, especially for electrical wire uh, coverings. Okay, so that's how it starts. It's very important that you all understand this next quote, because this, this got us to where, that, that stuff started off us down the path, this is how we got to where we are right now. So this was not an accident, this was not a let's have endless possibilities, this was absolutely a business decision um, to control how you behave. And so this is this guy named Lloyd Stauffer in a famous 1956 meeting of industry folks. And he said, the future of plastics is in the trash. Up to this point, up to this point, it was all this stuff. It was all this, this thermos, this radio that you would make and you would have for years, right? It's a valuable thing. It looks cool. It'll bring you utility for, you know, decades and decades or at least many, many years. And then, the, then this new thing comes on in the mid to late 50s, which is the future of plastics is in the trash can. It is time for the plastics industry to stop thinking about reuse packages and concentrate on single use. For the package that is used once and thrown away, like a tin can or a paper carton, represents not a one-shot market for a few thousand units, but an everyday recurring market measured by the billions of units. So this is, why, this is how we go down the path of every little apple covered in plastic and every little item in the store wrapped in, in some kind of uh, cellophane or something. So we see very explicit marketing that comes along with that, that turn towards disposability. Um, and, and, and it's all touted as this wonderful, uh, great thing. Um, we start to see some of the pushback culturally in the late 60s and the classic one, if you guys haven't seen it, you should all go watch The Graduate. And this is the famous scene where the young disaffected college goer doesn't, want, doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And as he's hanging out, the old mentor comes up and goes, let me tell you, the answer is plastic, right? So he says, I, I, just one word I want to say to you, just one word, yes sir, are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Right? So, so really coming to represent um, uh, now plastics is sort of this, this different thing. It's sort of this ominous, this sort of dangerous, this, this not cool thing anymore, not hip thing, but something that is um, uh, of the mainstream that maybe you don't like as much. Okay, uh, that's about as much of the cultural stuff as we'll talk about. I wanted to uh, now just talk a little bit about um, uh, some of like, where we are now. And so, so the specifics here aren't that important. All you need to know is look at the size of the arrows. The arrows represent the magnitude. And so most of the discussions around plastic waste and what policy, um, many folks that are not interested in changing our behavior want you to focus on that little orange, that little orange loop, right? 
which is the, 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 the relative small amount that we do recycle or that, do, that does go into a captured waste stream to deal with appropriately. Um, that's not what we care about, right? What we care about is the vast, vast majority, the big orange arrow to the left, and then the, the larger arrows to the right, which are, which are all the stuff that just leaks out of our system, that doesn't get captured, that can't be recycled, et cetera. That's the real issue. Um, do not get distracted by um, the, the token example or, or the you know, tenth of a percent of something that, that can be recycled. We're interested in the systemic situation that's going on here. Okay. So uh, there's exploding interest in this. Uh, there's, I can't wait for the AI to help me understand this because there's no <laughs> way I can keep up with papers anymore. Um, it's just insane. So um, this is you know, the classic, I'm an academic, right? So this is the classic thing we do. How many papers are there per year, right? And so uh, different databases, Google Scholar, Science Direct, it doesn't matter. Everything is going up exponential. There's no way to stay on top of all of this in the traditional sense. Um, in one sense, that's fantastic. That means a lot of our colleagues are digging into this and, and people are discovering wonderful new things and interesting new things all day, but it makes it hard for, for those of us that are trying to get a sense of you know, the lay of the land to keep up with that. So um, meetings and that kind of stuff are really um, helpful in that sense. But yeah, just since 2000, depending on what I want to pick, 10,000 to 20,000 papers. I don't know, I, I can barely read like two papers you know, a, a week. I don't know how people are supposed to read thousands. Okay. Um, in this plasticized world, I think the stuff that is probably most relevant to us in talking about policy things are some of these areas. So this is sort of, um, there's, there are other areas, of course, of research in microplastics and in plastic pollution, but these are some of the most important ones, I think, in the context of um, policy. So one is, the more we look, like, like you know, we just, saw, we just saw this slide, right? The more we look, we're staggered by the magnitude, the quantity of material either coming overall into our systems or in the particular snow, deep sea sediments, whatever, whatever the um, uh, system that we're interested in is. And then ubiquity, um, the stuff is everywhere, right? We, we now have evidence that's being incorporated into the geological record, right? So this is, this is clearly a marker of the Anthropocene, this, this material. Um, uh, we will often get, what is this material doing to us, right? That's, whenever we, we give a talk about microplastics, the people, the public, colleagues, oh, so how do, I, how do I not get contaminated? What's this doing to me? We don't know, but as we find, um, almost every study is some new perception of potential impact, um, and that can uh, definitely spur policy in people's reaction. Um, uh, don't have time for this to go in all depths, but suffice to say, on the left is um, a study of beach sand. Every single beach we've ever sampled across the state of California, the sand is, has, is full of microplastics. Every single beach around the planet, we've, I think we're up to like 350, 400 beaches we've sampled now. Every single beach, middle of the ocean, continental, doesn't matter, it, it's all over the place, so it's, it's everywhere. Lower left, uh, beer in microbrews, microplastics in microbrews, right? All that kind of stuff, we could talk about all these later. Um, uh, Upper right, um, inhalation. So, so we've measured twice as much microplastic in airborne samples indoors versus outdoors. So we're breathing it in, um, in agricultural soils, all over the place. And we all have, I'm sure, a, a ton of other examples. Um, lots and lots of evidence of this material all over the place. Um, I'll just end with this, this little part and just highlighting some things that appear to have gotten a lot of attention. And, and I hear a lot from uh, some of our electeds that they're really worried about this. And these are things related to our human health, especially um, uh, internal human goings on. So one is this, which is blood level uh, or, or detection of microplastics inside uh, human blood. Um, uh, this next one is uh, uh, the plaque study. So that we'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, inside, uh, when, when people are having heart attacks and, and their, their heart arteries are starting to harden and they're getting plaques building up, uh, the black here are, is the outlined black are plastic particles inside those plaques. And then this is from um, placental uh, uh, blood, placental fluid um, from uh, human babies. Every single baby that we looked at had microplastics in the placenta. Um, and so this is, this is more for your reference later on, but suffice it to say, um, uh, the one that really, so this first one is the blood, uh, uh, the blood sample. So 70%, 77% of the donors that were checked out, and this was not meant to be cohesive, it just grabbed, essentially grab a few blood samples. 77% of those people had um, microplastics circulate in their blood. And then um, the plaque one is interesting because one, um, uh, yeah. What, um, sorry, what no, no. Of 
particular yes. group? Yeah, so um, what you mean in terms of like, what would you human, human, human response or the detection mm -hmm. limit, you mean? Detection limit, yeah. Yeah, so these guys, so particularly the, the group doing the blood work spent a lot of time doing um, artificial doping in, in, of different mm -hmm. fluids and to see if they could, what their lowest detection limit was. Oh. Um, I don't think, I don't think I put it on here, but but yes. Um, uh, so I put it, yes. Yeah, so I have I have what the concentration they were finding is. Um, their detection limits were lower than this. I don't remember what they were off the top of my head, but um, yeah, that's the other thing to say is is um, uh, for those of us that haven't done a lot of plastic work, there is no way to be plastic free, right? Um, firstly, all of our technical and you guys, you guys should be trying in here if, if you want to say something. But, but, um, but I would say that all of the materials we have to have clean rooms are all plastic, or almost all plastic, or a mix of stainless steel and plastic. Um, so it really is akin to the folks at like JPL when they're trying to send a probe to look for DNA on Mars. Like, how do I build this and not have any DNA? And so, so most of us, we don't get too destroyed over that because it can completely consume your life. But rather, we try to do as clean as we can, HEPA filters, cotton clothing, that kind of stuff. But then always run controls. Controls, 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 controls. Controls of the water, controls of the soil, controls of the air, controls of the lab. Um, and then we use that as the no detection limit. Um, but but there, will always, there will always be something. And as we get to ever smaller and smaller particles, which we'll hear about later, like the nanoscale, it, it's like even crazier and crazier to be clean. But did I represent that okay, you guys? Okay, cool. Um, but it's been interesting how much this middle one, you would think that the babies would freak people out. I would, I would have thought the babies would have freaked people out. It's really this one. It's really the, the study that came out about seven, eight weeks ago about, um, and so this was, again, um, folks that were already having a heart problem. These folks went in and, and before they did like the stint, they did a little scraping. And they, they took a sample of that of the plaques, and then they did their procedure to get the person healthy and, and whatever. Um, and 58% uh, of those plaques, they had um, uh, mostly polyethylene inside there, which is scary and freaky and, and implies maybe, and, and, and the scanning electron microscopes showed not how we typically had environmental samples. They tend to be kind of jostled and kind of bounced and kind of broken. They appeared quite jagged and, and fresh, if you will, fresh plastics, uh, potentially, maybe, don't know, but correlative, speculative. Um, but the scary thing is then they followed these guys for three, then after this procedure was all done, then they followed them for three years. And they found that of the, the subset of those patients that did have microplastics in their plaque versus the people that just had, I don't know what to call it, clean plaque, um, uh, they were almost five times more likely to have a stroke or a heart attack in that three-year period. And that really seems to have gotten some of the, how do I say this? Some of the people that make laws that maybe don't think this stuff impacts them, <laughs> they suddenly snap to attention. And they're like, wait, maybe this has to do with me. And so, so that, that, that study seems to have been, I mean, just in a few weeks, it seems to have gotten a disproportionate amount of traction because it is so scary, but it seems particularly scary to a certain subset of folks, which is maybe useful. Sorry, you might not, is it only microplastics they found, or did they go down to the submicron? Uh, I th they, they did go down to the submicron, too, oh, okay. in some of them, but, but mostly it was micro. It was, it was sort of like on that micro, nano sort of okay. range. Yeah, please. Yes. Totally. Yeah, correlation or causation or yeah, totally. Completely agree. Yes. Okay, we need yeah. to care about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, regardless of like baby, like the future, like yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah. this is our future. Like, totally. Yeah, there's no, no concern there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
And, and, so, and so these are, so these, it's an excellent point. So we, this is not a controlled laboratory where we introduced microplastics and then saw the induction of plaque formation or something, right? So, so we're not chicken and egg, we're not entirely sure. But this is what typically happens, right? We're, we're still at that stage of, mm -hmm. could it be happening? And so this, is a, this falls in the category of, hey, this might be going on. Um, and that's really where a lot of our science is, right? And, and so the next era is going to be us doing much more standardized controls. So, so Wynn and, and our lab and a bunch of us maybe in the room have helped out with um, creating this new drinking water standard so that we can measure microplastics in drinking water consistently, right? And so, and so that was a huge step forward because um, before, like, he's doing his way, I'm doing it my way, she's doing it her way, and, and, and um, we really need more of that standardization so we can start to get to these more robust modeling of fate and transport and stuff. Um, but yeah, excellent point, good point, good point. Um, okay, so let's talk, and then um, before we, we start talking about some of the policies, just want to talk about um, a public perception. How, how, how do people think about microplastics and, and potential plastic policies and stuff? So this is, um, so the first slides here are from, um, so one of my classes, we do uh, opinion polling every year, every fall in Los Angeles County, uh, Ventura County, Santa Barbara County. And so we, it varies, um, but um, the COVID years were a little bit weird, but, but um, we typically do 1,000-ish to 1,500 people per year face-to-face -face polling. And it's mostly oriented around coastal management issues. And so, um, so uh, one question we haven't asked in a while because it never changed, but this this pattern has been consistent since people started asking this question in the 1970s. And so that is, rank, and so in this case, so I've asked about fisheries and effect on the coast and wetlands, it doesn't really matter, but we say rank these threats, these sort of generic threats to, to ecosystems, to the natural world. And so um, j just have a look at the coastal one is the cleanest one, I think for us. Um, and so this is, uh, and so to the left would be your number one greatest threat or the biggest problem, the thing we have to solve first. And then to the right would be the, the um, it might be a problem, but it's the least problematic of the possibility, right? So we're ranking. And consistently, everybody puts pollution as by far the number one source, right? Whereas when, um, you know, I talk to a conservation scientists or whatever, they talk about over harvesting or, or habitat destruction or things of that nature, the public uh, thinks of pollution, pollution, pollution. And so um, that's to our advantage when we talk about um, uh, that's to our disadvantage if we're talking about trying to manage invasive species or something, right? But it's to our advantage when we talk about something like plastic pollution. We know that everybody inherently is already thinking this is a, this is a priority, this should be a priority. Okay, next, this is uh, same, same survey. This is a couple different years. This is blue is 2019. We didn't do this survey in um, 2020 or 2021 because of the pandemic, um, and then started up again in 2022 and 2023. So these are consecutive years. And so these are, um, have you heard of plastic in any of these locations or, or people finding plastics or microplastics in any of these things? And so pretty consistently about 80%, and so this ranked from where people mostly have heard about it to where they have heard about it uh, less likely. And so this corresponds to where we've also been looking for plastic first and, and where the research initially came from. So waterborne um, plastics, um, coastal zones, ocean stuff washing into the receptive you know, basin of an area. Um, a little bit less so in, in inland systems, a little bit less, and that's mostly in, in sort of physical settings, a little bit less so in critters. Humans, these first two years, we weren't asking explicitly about it, so these are just when people volunteered. So this, this is artificially low these years, but you know, we, people have heard about it in people, in the food they're eating, in beer, because we work on beer, so I always ask about beer, um, and then uh, in air. And so the point is, the vast majority of people um, are identify that, uh, you know, that this trash is a problem and people recognize it either they've seen it themselves or they've heard news stories about it and so again there's there's already a high level of awareness built into our culture about this unlike chromium 6 unlike you know pfas or some of this stuff where we have to explain what it is the very nature of the word plastic everybody has a sense of what plastic is and so it's it's sort of a, a main line into their attention where some of our other substances it doesn't really follow that way okay we'll hear about in a little bit um, about uh, uh, this international treaty that's coming online soon, hopefully. 
Um, but this is some polling that NRDC did a couple, uh, two months ago to try to look at um, where nationally where people are standing. And so this is asking if, if this is a major crisis, um, just, a, just a regular old crisis, or not really a problem, or not a problem at all. And so um, what we see is across all areas, the vast majority of people thinks that plastic waste, plastic pollution, is at least a crisis, if not a significant crisis we need to deal with. So this notion of, are people interested? Yes, they think this is a problem we should be tackling. Um, and, when we, and, and this has been going on for some time. So this is back to our data. And so this is asking about, um, and so this is um, relative support. So this is a relative scale of, is this, are we, do you like this policy, is this good or is this bad? And so it goes from plus two, which is off the scale, to minus two, which is down below, which is off the scale. Um, and so, so people were completely neutral they would, they would vote zero. If it's positive, they like it. The most positive thing that when we ask the general public in Southern California about that they like in terms of coastal management, it's the, found, it's the formation of Channel Islands National Park. Everybody loves that. So that is the most positive measurement. So I have that there for reference. The worst or, or the least supportive uh, thing is uh, ease of permits. And so everybody thinks that it's horrible to get a permit. And so they don't like, you know, so, so that's sort of the bottom. What we find is plastic bag bans are towards the upper end of the spectrum, right? So we, we ask about dozens of different factors, but, but I didn't want to put them all here and confuse you. And that has remained fairly consistent throughout. In early on in 2012, before we really had many plastic bag bans, there was some support, but not so much. But over time, it's increased um, uh, as we go forward. So the public, generally speaking, likes plastic bag bans here in California. Okay. A couple more contextualizations before we go talk about policy. Um, this is a question we asked, um, which is I think is useful when we talk to legislators and people about doing policy. So this is, we gave folks, uh, and this, this data is a slightly smaller data set, there's only 791 respondents, but this is um, giving them a whole range of gnarly problems. And so again, it's a relative scale here. So to the right is super hard to solve, and to the left, is easy to solve, relatively easy to solve. All everybody understands are all hard problems. But tell me which ones are the worst. And what we and so whether these these are significantly different from each other, the way we did the questions, it makes it a little bit hard to 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 figure out the, the correct um, error here. But but suffice it to say, microplastics are on the same scale as sea level rise, homelessness, and climate change. Right, uh, much, perceived as much more challenging than nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, than overfishing, than wildfires, right? So, so that tells us that people see it as a, a real problem, but also as something that is not going to be easy to deal with. So the public is not expecting an easy fix. They're not expecting a silver bullet. We don't have to solve everything um, with a particular piece of legislation or whatever. In terms of their self-reported behavior, we started asking this question after COVID where the governor suspended our, uh, our, our single-use plastic bag bans for understandable reasons. People were freaked out. We didn't know how COVID was, we didn't know how the virus was spreading. And so, um, and so we said, okay, you can go back to using single-use plastic bags in supermarkets and stuff. And so we start, in 2020, we started asking people, hey, how has your use of single-use plastics, uh, a foodware, bags, all that kind of stuff, changed relative to before the pandemic? And in 2020, everybody was using much more um, uh, plastic than, uh, than beforehand. 2021, it was not significantly different from what they reported using 2019 and before. But then in the years since, um, uh, people are reporting using less, right? And so whether, that, whether that, that's exactly less, the quantity is unclear, but at least the tendency, they all report that they're trying to use less. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. for COVID mm -hmm. and how it's kind of weird that it goes down a little bit after COVID and like the knowledge of plastic and it kind of makes me wonder if people were just so freaked out and concerned about COVID that it just trumped like oh clearly plastic. oh in, in 2020 completely it's like, it's completely so 100% like who cares about plastics anymore 100% oh, that's exactly what was going on okay. yeah people were not worried about the planet they were worried about dying or catching this at the time, especially is unknown. How do we get it? So absolutely, 100. percent That's totally what was going on. But, but uh, on the, the graphic on the left, so this guy. Variant, it, it means that people were not worried about that. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, microplastics? 
Oh, COVID. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 there, so to be clear, we picked all hard problems. So this is not to say that they don't think COVID variants were hard to deal with, but they think relatively speaking, it was relatively easy to deal with COVID variants compared to racism or climate change or microplastics. So it's a rel these are relative scales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this, is, this, this doesn't mean easy, it just means not easier, just easier, yeah. Cool, and so, and so again, the trend is, the trend is people claiming whether they actually behave this way or they're just saying this to our survey, right? But, but, but it's pretty clear, we see it in the hundreds and hundreds of people that, that there seems to be this, this trying to use less, right? Either trying or, or being forced to use less. And so that's positive. That shows us that we're at least on the right momentum uh, or your side of the momentum scale. And it's probably not like to, sa to save the planet. It's probably because of all the health studies that's right. that are coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. 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 Like COVID really killed us. This might kill everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not implying altruism or, or whatever, but this, yeah. but this is how people re yeah. report that they're. I'm so worried though that the other things, you know, there's a lot of other really crazy stuff going on. Yeah. That oh, completely. Fear. Agreed. Agreed. Um, this seems to be pretty consistent, though. Young people, middle-aged folks, men, women. It, so th this seems to be that this this less plastic seems to be across all groups. So it doesn't appear to like it's not, it's not as if the young people are like screw it. I'm not worrying about this. Um, so, but you're right. That's not to say that something else can't come away, can't come by tomorrow and drive people to use more plastic. But but at least we're kind of moving in the right direction. So there's so so what this stuff is showing us in summary, is people understand this is an issue, people are worried about this as an issue, um, and, and while yes, a pandemic will make them go back to using plastic, that, that they understand dealing with it is non-trivial, and they are, at least rhetorically, interested in using less, right? Whether, that's, whether that means just one fork less or 75 forks less, we don't know, but, but again, I think these are all positive for us when we, talk, when we move to talk about the Polling. Okay, the last little bit before I turn it over to um, uh, Sam over here is, um, is to talk about this, uh, okay, so this national polling. The other one to say is um, there's strong desire to see the U.S. government create plastic pollution policies that reduce plastic pollution. And there's all different ways to say this. You guys can look at the, um, look at the, uh, the study. But even when, this is the most, I think most interesting, even when the, the, the prompt is, even if this policy tool might impact jobs, right? And even then, even um, uh, the, the vast majority of folks still think that we should go forward with this, even almost 40% of Republicans that maybe are not inclined to do anything that's gonna mess with jobs. So there's, so there's really strong support here at the, at the societal level to do something of, at the US level, and then the same thing internationally. And a particular highlights are when you talk about benefits to human health. Um, that's a strong, as you guys have already identified in our discussions here, that, that is definitely a, a, a way to get a lot of attention and support and, and, and link it to, to better human health outcomes. Um, but even when we talk about um, uh, making this, whatever the international agreement is, have impact on climate change, have impact on fossil fuel consumption, um, that is also a positive, right? Even almost 40% of Republican folks would say that, uh, yes, this is the, I, I would be supportive of an international treaty that, that did do this. So strong support for both doing stuff at not, not just the California Coast people, but for US-wide and also for engaging in international collaboration. So I think that's really key to say. Okay, with that, um, we maybe can take a, a quick uh, a minute or two stretch while Sam comes up here, if you guys need to take a quick stretch, and we're gonna start talking about um, p particular policies. Okay, welcome back everyone. I think we're all here. So I'm going to present a few slides on um, the types of policies that are um, around in terms of trash and microplastics, and then we'll move on to a little exercise after that. So um, one of the barriers to 
uh, policy is preemption. So at a local level, there might be some local ordinances or things in terms of plastic pollution. But then a state, at the state level, a law can be made to preempt these laws and hinder them from going forward. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, macroplastics, so large plastic and trash, and then move on to the microplastic legislation that's around. So. Um, the, the graphic shows us all the multiple ways that trash gets into our waterways. So trying to find regulations and legislate these kind of pollutions, as um, Sean mentioned, are very difficult and oftentimes don't work, obviously, but it's a good way to start the conversation and hopefully improve um, as time moves on. Time moves on. So um, the trash amendments, for example, um, uh, became effective in 2015 and basically um, there's permits that allow certain amounts of pollutants into our uh, waters and riverways and, and has been um, sort of successful um, and has been going on since 2015. And then um, we all know about the um, plastic bag ban. Um, so this was SB 270 where stores were required to charge it, uh, 10 cents per bag. Um, and then the, the stores that sold the bags had to keep the money to, for the cost of providing new ba bags and compliance uh, with these uh, bag bans and provide educational and um, uh, materials and campaigns. Um, but they could not require customers to purchase bags. Um, and what we found that these bag bans did reduce the amount of plastic bags that were used, but um, to go around this legislation, stores created a thicker bag, which was more difficult to recycle. So in the end, we ended up producing more plastic. Um, and here's just some data to show this, that um, these policies can work. So for example, the, in terms of the bag ban, uh, each year, there was definitely a less usage of bans per person in, in all these um, areas. And in, in another study, it shows that um, the, the volunteers who did coastal cleanups show, saw a decrease in the number of bags that they were picking up in their um, trash surveys. But what we d did find, as I mentioned before, was an increase in the amount of plastic we created because of creating these thicker bags that were meant to be reusable, but oftentimes we kept using them the same way that we did the single-use bags. Um, and created more uh, plastic in the end. So, so this is a, um, a scenario where we had a policy that sort of worked, but there was a loophole that caused more of an issue. And now we have used that information to try improve on it. So SB 1053 um, is basically a new law that's trying to be implemented where um, stores are completely prohibited from um, providing these uh, bags, even the, the thicker ones, in the hopes that people will bring their own bags or have to buy the paper bags. So this is just an example of how we have a policy, we've implemented it, it kind of worked, we found where the issues were, and then we tried to improve it. It's been 10 years since California became the first state in the nation to ban single-use plastic bags, and in that time, plastic bag waste has increased by 47%. What happened? Let's dig into this recent LA Times article from Suzanne Rust and Talk Trash. First, the garbage data. In 2014, when the ban was passed, Californians threw away 315 million pounds of plastic bags. By 2022, Californians were throwing away 462 million pounds of plastic bags. That's a 47% increase. If you've paid 10 cents in the last 10 years for a plastic bag, then you may have a guess as to why plastic bag waste per pound has gone up. These reusable bags are just thicker single-use plastic bags. But these bags are compliant with the 2014 law because I paid 10 cents for them and they are technically recyclable. But most recycling centers do not accept them. Literally even Cal Recycle says plastic bags aren't recycled on a large scale in California. California. So they go to the landfill. Recently, two separate bills were introduced by the California State Legislature to close the loophole that the plastic bag companies slipped through in the first place by proposing legislation that would also ban these thicker plastic bags. Will it become law? If the plastic industry fights like it did back in 2014, you can expect them to spend millions of dollars to try and either block the legislation or amend it to the point that a thicker plastic bag is the answer to banning single-use plastic bags. 
So basically summarizes the issues we are trying to deal with. Um, so uh, some of the other policies um, is, uh, for example, the single-use straw ban, where uh, full-service restaurants in California are prohibited from um, providing single-use plastic straws unless requested by the uh, consumer. But it does not completely ban uh, single-use plastic straws. Um, and it just prohibits these uh, restaurants from providing them um, automatically. And this policy um, isn't working because of a lack of enforcement. But um, uh, we see like in Hong Kong, for example, uh, with the uh, ban on straws that they had, there was a decrease in um, the use of straws by about 40%. But overall, plastic waste increased by 10%. And Straws itself doesn't um, account for that much of the plastic waste into the ocean every year. So um, I guess like uh, images with a turtle who has a straw up their nose prom prompts these kind of le legislations to be developed. Um, and it is moving in the right direction, but maybe that the item that we're choosing might not be the most effective one. But it is important because it's a gateway to us talking about our single-use plastic waste. Um, and then uh, following on from that, um, the AB 1276 was a fast food single use ban, um, which went into effect in January of 2022, where retail food facilities um, only provided single use foodware and accessories upon request. So the same thing as a straw ban, not providing it automatically, but only on request. And the same thing with this policy, it's not entirely working because of the lack of enforcement. Um, and then more recent legislation um, requires that all packaging be compostable or recycled by 2034. And um, so we're seeing that as we're moving through time, we are improving um, our legislations. OK, so that's um, the large plastics. And then now moving on to microplastics. Um, in 2000, yes? Sorry, I just wanted to quickly say about yeah. the sippy cup of Starbucks. That's like my oh, yeah. pet peeve that I see people with straws <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. No, I. No, I totally get it. Yeah, it's always um like these um producers or large companies or corporations are always trying to find a workaround for these bans mm -hmm. and trying to get around it. We have to keep working to improve this um, legislation. So in terms of microplastics in California, um, in 2008 we had one of the first microplastic. Um, which was uh, stricter regulation on the manufacturing, handling, and transportation of pre-production pellets, so these plastic pellets that were used for plastic um, items. And then in 2015, um, the, the most, one of the most famous ones is prohibiting and selling personal care products that contain microbeads um, for exfoliating or rinse-off purposes. And now, um, since then, in 2015, there's been bills to develop a uh, statewide microplastic monitoring strategy um, so that we decrease the ecological risk of microplastics to the coastal environment and also develop methods for testing of microplastics in drinking water. And, and this is also probably a good thing is sparking from our earlier conversations where if it affects us and our health personally, it's more likely to go ahead because it seems like that's all we care about. <laughs> um, so yeah, as I was talking about the microbeads um, act. Yeah. Oh, so, I'm sorry. California stand stand. So like this legislation that we have in California, are we the only? Yeah, I think we're the definitely the at the the forefront of these mm -hmm. um, legislations. Yeah, we're not the only, but we're yeah. Um, we'll have a tool in a little bit. We'll show you guys. You can actually go and, and look at the policies of each state. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But we definitely want it like leading. And it's a good and a bad thing like we were discussing earlier because we come up with a policy or legislation that kind of works and then it helps another state improve theirs and they get a better one and it's just a, a circle. So, yeah. 
Yeah, so the microbead free waters um, pro prohibits the manufacturing, packaging, and distribution of these microbeads in our personal care products, um, including um, over the counter drugs such as toothpaste. And as far as we know, this policy is actually working because since the uh, implementation of this policy, there's been very few microbeads found um, in our environment. And then uh, microfibers are also a big issue. Um, if you work in environmental, if you work with environmental samples, we see that these microfibers are ubiquitous, one of the most common microplastics that we find. And one of the ways that these microplastic, uh, microfibers make their way into the environment is from our clothing, through our washing machines, and then into our stormwater systems. And one of the ways to, to reduce the amount of microfibers is to have um, filters um, on our washing machines. Uh, but unfortunately, this bill was vetoed, um, where we were requiring that these microplastic filters be uh, put onto washing machines. But um, it's just something to think about. Um, and then we have the National Farewell to Foam Act, where um, the bill was introduced to phase out the use of plastic foam, often called styrofoam, in our foodware and other single-use items. Um, and then the Plastic Pellet-Free Waters Act, where uh, um, it was originally in introduced in 2020, and then again in 2024 to address the plastic pollution in our waterways and along our and, and along our coasts. Um, but this is also a voluntary initiative and isn't really working. Um, and so that was that was the legislation that we have at a local level. Some are working, some are not working, but it's a start and a move in the right direction. Um, and then uh, there's also. Um, international policies where the goal is to create a legal binding global agreement to reduce our plastic pollution um, similar to the Paris Climate Accord. Um, and then going back to can these policies work, we see that um, this is a map of all the petrochemical facilities in the country and then this one is of the resin facilities and we see that even though they may not be in the California side anymore, they stole somewhere, creating all plastic. Um, and this. Yeah, and I, and that, so that's just important to say that um, we need to be careful with these policies because it's great that we don't have maybe resin factories in, in California, but we tend to just shove them off to communities that are mm -hmm. perhaps less able to deal with the issue. And so, so um, uh, we do need to make sure that we're not just Not that we shouldn't go forward with some policies, but this needs to be looked at in terms of what what would this exclusion or limitation do to the industry? Do they just do they really stop, or are they just run somewhere with less mm -hmm. oversight? Yep. So does that mean that policies are more based around production and manufacturing, and not so much on trade and like just sale? Well, I mean, some of the policies. Because if they're like going to another. Yeah, because it's a state policy, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that, that's the that's the drive for the international treaty, mm -hmm. which um, has not been decided yet. It's a, it has there's not, nothing to definitively say this is what it will look like, but they're getting close. But that that's to address that exact issue that, that we would have really strict policies here, or we would only have say a, a manufacturing constraint in Europe and and, and, um, and not something about sale or distribution. So it's trying to be holistic about it. Um, whether it actually passes in an effective manner is, is a little bit uh, in doubt, but, yeah. but it's, to, it's to address that, that exact concern. Yeah, I, okay, so what I'll say, a, a great resource for folks to check out is this, um, if you just Google globalplasticlaws.org, you'll get to it. Um, and this is, um, this and I think the next one you have to you have to register I think really quickly just so they, they can understand what's going on. But this is a really cool resource. And once you register, you can um, you can use there's a couple different interfaces. The easiest one I think is the map. And when you do this, you can click down and you can click down as 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 much resolution as, as the entity has. So 
So in our case, you could look at U.S. laws, or you could look at you could look at state level laws, um, or even county level uh, laws. And so um, it's a way to uh, that exact question. So what is Florida doing about microplastics or whatever? You can you can drill down and see what the current. Mm -hmm. um, this is not it's not proposed legislation. This is stuff that's on the books, but you can you can compare different countries, different regions, um, to to see what they're actually doing. So that's that's one tool. Another tool is. Um, this one, the guy that just came out, uh, and again, this one is uh, plastichem-project.org, which you guys can, can um, Google and, and get to really quickly. <clears throat> the database is actually just an Excel database you can download. So it's, it is a database you can play with, but you actually can get it onto your computer. This is, this, is, um, this is basically an attempt to look at all the components of plastic and try to round them up. And so as we know, we have the, the backbone which is you know, the, main, the main resin, the main you know, PVC, whatever, that, that, the, the main structural material. But then in most cases, we're adding you know, uh, anti-oil compounds or colorants or things about flexibility or thermal stability, stability whatever. So all those things together are what, what is in this, this mix of this item that we're pulling on. And so this is, is the most um, cohesive attempt so far to try to take that stuff into account. And um, so there's more than 16,000 individual compounds in the, in the database, um, but only about 6% of them, actually less than 6% of them are regulated globally. So the vast majority of these things, we talked about precautionary principle earlier, but even, even aside from precautionary principle, even just any principle, um, almost nothing here is being um, uh, regulated in terms of the quantity produced, traded, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and of concern, there's about 16, more than 16,000 chemicals in there. About 10,000 don't have any, um, you know, ecotops, anything about them at all. So we can make some guesses, we can make some educated guesses that it's probably gonna do this or could do that. But um, for this first principles of, might this be a risk to critters, to people, to babies, to whatever, we usually don't even have the, the first principle idea to make the first sketch, let alone any kind of true safety transport and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so anyway, so but, but it's a really useful resource if you're engaging in policy and you want to talk about, you know, if we were to constrain this type of material, in effect, we would be constraining, you know, a lot of its sister compounds or, 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 or materials that go in. Um, and some of those are quite toxic and it might be perhaps more effective to talk about if we were to ban, I don't know, PVC, we'd also be banning um, this other plasticizer or something like that. So the, the global laws and the plastic chem are really useful resources, I think, for beginning to hunt around and, and, and get a sense of either justifying the need for something or looking at potential impacts if we were to go forward with that and how we compare to other things. And that, that's just a screenshot of the plastic chem report. Yep. Yeah. So going back to the map that you have all the petrochemical facilities, um, Oh. I'm from Texas, and they tried to do a bad ban in El Paso and in Austin, but then Texas, in turn, banned bag bans. Is there any way around stuff like that? Or yeah, that was a preemption thing I was talking about at the start. Like, yeah. you have these local ordinances or local legislation, and then you have, like, a state preemption. And I, I read somewhere that there's then... Bans on <laughs> preemption bans and it's just layers. So <laughs> bans on bans on bans, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so in that situation, there's nothing you can do. It's just you, you can't pass anything related to that at all. I guess it would depend on the particular the jurisdiction, but um, uh, I think um, yeah, that's right. I think I think you'd have to challenge that law. So I, th I think you would have to use something like the heart attack study or something like, like if you found, I mean, the plastic bags are usually uh, like LDPE or whatever, but, but still, but, but if you found a material and then you found a health effect mm. to that, I think if, if you had standing, I don't have standing to say, but if you're a resident of that state, theoretically, you could say, hey, you're saying this, is, this thing is a potential health threat to me and this, this um, you know, judicious, not reactive, but this policy to try to be protective, you said we can't be protective of that, that's a threat to me. So that would be, the mechanism would have to be to cha challenge that particular, um, you have to have standing, you have to be able to challenge that, um, 
with a with a direct harm that, that you are the person making that allegation. The other that's one approach. The other approach is if the feds create the standard, right? That they would say this is the new standard. You can't produce I don't know styrofoam in the U.S. Right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, so that's essentially what we're trying. Well, I should be careful. I'm not trying, but that's the legislation that we currently have in California mm -hmm. is sort of part two from what. Sam was talking about about the, the 2014 where the industry basically said, oh, we have this new cool thing where we can reuse up to, or we can create plastic bags out of up to 20% post-consumer, or, or at least they said 20% post-consumer waste. So can we like get out the ban? And the legislature was like, um, sure, I guess. And that was the loophole that they ran through. Mm -hmm. The new one we have is, is particularly focusing on what we call extended producer responsibility. So it's not, so to try and take it away from you and like, do I buy the bit? It's like to say, hey, if you are producing this material generator, you have some responsibility. You can't just pass it off on the municipality or the fast food restaurant or the mm -hmm. whoever. Like you're responsible for that, yeah. um, dealing with that waste stream. Uh, and so um, and so one of the first things that's, gonna, that's coming up, so most of the stuff is in about eight years or so, but styrofoam is coming up next year. So styrofoam, people, there's a, there's a carve out for seafood because people put um, a, a fish in seafood and there's a carve out for medical, uh, uh, like medical containers if you have an organ in like a, a styrofoam cooler kind of. But for most things, um, if the producers can't prove to state regulators that they can completely recycle styrofoam, they're not allowed to make styrofoam. Mm. Um, and so, so, so that type of approach is going to lead to, uh, I mean, who knows, maybe there's some super smart chemists that figured something out, but I <laughs> think nobody's going to figure anything out in the next six months. Um, but at that level, was at the fed, federal level, and the state said, no, you can't ban it, the fed stuff would trump the state um, in that context. So that, so that was going to challenge it legally, or, or a higher authority would, would, um, would have to be consistent. The micro beads ban came at the federal level at a similar time to the California ban. So, like some things, yeah. it seems like the feds are really on it and they're, yeah. they're happy to do it. I think in that case, it was maybe even like an international yeah. issue that they were facing because there was a bunch of studies in the Great Lakes that were finding lots of micro beads. Yeah. So it's like, oh, can Canadian U.S. waters are like contaminated potentially by yeah. our stuff. We should jump on this, but. Um, yeah, and that's why that one was so successful because it was a larger scale, more people involved, higher authority. Yeah. Question? No. Okay, so now we're probably going to do. Yeah, let's do an exercise. Okay. Let's do an exercise. So, uh, <laughs> So do you want to go and talk about Sam? You go. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to take uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so here with Sam. We're doing on time. Um, and the idea is getting, getting I guess we can do pairs. Or, yeah, pairs, pairs, pairs. Yeah, we can do pairs or, or threes. Either one is pairs or threes. Um, and the idea is uh, we want you guys to think about um, uh, a particular pl plastic pollution thing that you're worried about. Um, and uh, we want you guys to. Um, uh, and then this could be one that already, we might have a, a policy solution already for that. Could be in development, it could be like not even conceived of yet. You can use the global um, uh, plastic uh, laws database to take a look if you're not sure if we have that or not. Um, uh, and, uh, but again, you can also just make it up from scratch. It doesn't have to be an existing thing. And then we just wanna um, have you go through that. So, so how did this thing work or how could this thing work? We want you to kind of go through, okay, so maybe we would limit it here, and we would do this, and it would have this consequence. So we want you to do a little bit of thought e exercise, and then once you've crafted that, we want you guys to answer these questions about, is it, is it how systemic is it? Is it really focused on one particular thing? Is it focused on the entire industry or the entire state or something like that? Um, and then these other questions. Uh, I do want to flag, we had intended to go over uh, microplastic accreditation in this session, and how that's working right now, we're probably not gonna have time for that today. I did share the slides, and if y'all would like to talk about the accreditation process, um, we're happy to. So I think we should take 
um, some time to everybody get, get a stretch, go to the bathroom before our next session starting at 4 in 15 minutes.